you know, when it comes to why I'm here with you, I have been an exam prep coach and project management trainer for many years. We're pushing 12, 13 years now. <clears throat> and over the years, I've conducted something like 250 trainings. Uh, the training sessions have been on the ASM, like this one, the PMP, PMI ACP, PMI RMP. I've had over 5,000 folks come through my trainings over the years. I've got a pass rate that's about 99%. So those are the certifications that I have. Of course, the one that you're concerned with is that one right there. Am I qualified to do this? <laughs> Maybe I am with that kind of a pass rate, and I've been doing this uh, course for a while. I actually love this course. This is a great course. I have been doing project management for many years, and I've had project management experience in the business sector, the public sector, and as an entrepreneur. Um, for example, I was a project manager at Compaq and HP, vice president of biz development at a company called LegalNet, executive director of the California Commission on the Bicentennial Celebration of the United States Constitution, California director of the National Center for Constitutional Studies. You know, what's interesting is that even though sound rather varied, um, all of them had some kind of content development and um, presenting uh, responsibilities with them. So I've been at this kind of stuff for 35 years plus. And you know what's interesting is when it comes to a workshop like this where we're seeking a certification, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are studies that are done every year by various organizations that compare what certified project managers make compared to what their uncertified colleagues make. And depending on the year, it ranges between 15 and 20% more if you're certified. Now, that may not be your driving factor to be here uh, and participate in this, but to make more money is a good thing. And I just did a calculation that, uh, you know, of all those that have gone through my workshops and considering that average increase in income, I figure that they collectively make $60 million a more, more per year now than they did before. And I've been with uh, Simply Learn now doing classes for them in these various topics uh, for over three years. And Simply Learn, which you may or may not know, is the largest training organization in the world and was recently recognized as one of the top 10 most influential or education organizations in the world. So you are in the right spot if you want to um, get certified and get ahead in this or another area. Simply Learn is the place to be. And we have been around now for about six years. Our journey started relatively small. And you can see that from those more humble beginnings, we now have basically a presence throughout the world. And we offer training and certification prep classes for all of these organizations here. Of these organizations, this is the one that we are focusing on for this workshop, EXIN, and the ASM certification. And we have certification courses in all of these different categories right here. Of course, of these categories, the one that is relevant for us right now is Agile Scrum certifications. But there are others, and you know, kind of when we get into a mode of the study and the prep and the getting ready for a standardized test, um, sometimes it's a good time to take on more than just one thing. And somebody at Simply Learn came up with this brilliant idea of what they call an all-access online classroom pass, where if you upgrade your tuition, you can have access to over 25 of our certification exam prep courses, 120 instructor-led batches, meaning live batches like this uh, for 90 days, and so you can fast track your career at your place, your pace, while you're kind of in the mode of doing this. And so the way it works is um, you pick which 
of the certifications that you want, like you're doing for this. You can choose whether you want to do a weekend batch or a weekday batch. If you do a weekday batch, it's going to be a three-hour session uh, Monday through Friday. And if you do a weekend batch like this one, it'll be four-hour sessions on Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, etc. cetera. Uh, so, and then not only do you get access to the 120 um, – instructor-led batches, but you have access to the e-learning content for six months. Now, and if you're not happy, we'll give you your money back, and it's just, you know, a way to, you know, kind of leverage your mode that you're in. And I have a number of individuals that have been in other classes that were doing two or three at the same time. So I'm not sure if that's relevant to you or not, but that is an option. And as soon as this is displayed on my desktop, I can share it, which I just did. So you can see that this is the course overview. And when you're finished with this course, you should be able to – I know it says right here, after completing this lesson, but really what we're talking about is the course here. Um, you should be able to play the uh, the role of an effective Scrum Master. You should be able to lead Agile and Scrum transformations, meaning going from waterfall to Scrum or from waterfall to some other method in Agile. Be able to guide your teams using the proven and recommended practices of Scrum. Describe practices of other Agile methods and adapt those that are beneficial for your team, that are relevant for your project. And then you should be able to also um, talk about Scrum in the context of DevOps, as well as linking Scrum to IT service management. So that's, and then of course, be ready to pass the exam. So, um, you know, Scrum, so let me back up. We've talked about uh, traditional project management versus agile project management. And different kinds of projects lend themselves to being best managed by either waterfall or by agile. And waterfall is the traditional make a big plan up front, get your baselines established, make sure you know you've, you understand the requirements, and then go get the work done when you're finished. Um, you know, present it to the customer and do the handoff. And so, while you're executing on a waterfall project, you're looking at your actual results, comparing them to your baselines, and that's how you do. Agile, which is really a family of methods, is a different approach. It's an evolutionary, incremental approach that fits well with projects where there's a lot of uncertainty about the scope. So the solution to deliver the scope will reveal itself or be discovered in an evolutionary way as the project goes forward. And rather than completing the project overall and then showcasing it for the customer like in Waterfall, or in Waterfall you can chuck it up, chunk it up into big phases and deliver it that way. Agile is different. We do very small increments. And at the end of each increment, we're delivering value to the customer. And, and, then, and we discover how to actually get to the solution that the, that the customer wants. So waterfall, you've got a stable uh, scope, and you don't expect a lot of change. Great. In Agile, um, there's uncertainty, and it's relatively complex. And of all of the Agile methods, Scrum is the most popular of them. About 50% of all Agile projects use Scrum. And then the next most popular one is extreme programming, and that's about 30%. So 80% of all agile projects are going to be using either Scrum or XP. And even though there's a lot of folks that don't like the idea of doing hybrid projects, um, those that practice Scrum actually end up using a lot of XP uh, practices as well. 
So um, the bottom line is, is that when it comes to Agile, Scrum is the most used, most proven, and it delivers. It actually works, and it works well. So our focus uh, for this course is going to be broadly on Agile, and I'll even take you through a little bit about XP and a couple other methods that belong to the family of Agile. But we're going to drill down on Scrum, and so when we talk about project life cycles, it will be how to do a project using Scrum. And um, there are a number of roles for a Scrum project. We're going to cover all of them, but we're going to spend most of our time on Scrum Master, which is one of the roles. And then we're going to talk about how to scale Agile. Um, Agile was originally designed for small projects with small co-located teams, but as things have changed over the years, Agile can be adapted to very large enterprise-sized projects. And so one of our lessons is dedicated to that. And then also um, we're going to dedicate one whole lesson to doing a transition from waterfall to scrum. So um, this certification is unique in that regard. Um, there are certifications like Certified Scrum Master. Um, that's not offered by Exin. It's offered by, I think it's the Scrum Alliance. And there's value to that, um, but it's one that doesn't require training. You won't be able to sit for the ASM exam until you finish this training. Um, with the CSM, it's kind of an open book thing, um, a little bit more of a, uh, you know, you go do some training and the test is proctored right there. Um, and there's value in that. I'm not saying there isn't, but the the Scrum Master, Certified Scrum Master training and certification uh, doesn't get into transition like this does. Um, there's also another Agile certification, and this one's offered by PMI, so the PMI ACP. And um, that certification gets um, much deeper into um, the family of Agile. And so that course will cover, um, oh, I think it's like eight or nine different Agile methods. Um, most of the emphasis will be on Scrum because of its popularity. But the course itself is more generic about Agile. And there's value in that, but the ACP doesn't get into uh, the scale and Agile like this one. So, um, you know, if you wanted to go get another Agile certification, and this is me, but the one I'd recommend is the PMI ACP. So, you know, I kind of back to my career coaching thing. Get your ASM, and then if you want to continue, go get your PMP probably, or PRINCE2, depending on uh, your environment and where you think you'll be, uh, and then go get your PMI ACP. And once you have that, you are going to be well-equipped to run projects, and you'll be very desirable to employers out there. Not that you're not now, but, you know, they like to see those, you know, those letters after your name. And then also in that mix is DevOps and integrating um, into IT service management. So maybe, you know, some DevOps and some IT work would also serve you well. Um, and, you know, I'm not one that particularly thinks standardized testing is that great of a way to measure someone's knowledge and predictable potential in the real world. I'm just not. Um, I've seen people who just really have a hard time passing a standardized test who just crush it in the real world. Um, and kind of vice versa. I see people who are really good at taking tests and then, you know, put them in the real world and they just don't do so well. Um, but that said, there's no better way to really present yourself to the world um, as to what your skill sets and experience is. So while standardized testing may not be the best predictor, it is the best way to demonstrate um, your pedigree, you know, your history and what you bring to the table. So it's important. And uh, learning how to pass the test and get it done and, and have those initials 
that you can put after your name at the bottom of your emails and on your business cards, etc. You know, like I was showing you earlier, probably means 15 to 20 percent more money. Plus, it fast, it fast tracks your career. So um, this course here, now I'm down to this bottom box here. This course here um, is going to accomplish two main things in summary. It's going to train you, give you lots of knowledge, and it's also going to prepare you for the ASM uh, certification. Um, the target audience, I think we pretty well saw that when we were introducing each other, um, uh, each of us to ourselves, um, and I commented on that, you can see that, you know, those of us that are here in this group, the perfect target audience, um, and we were all in kind of different places, but yet all relevant for this. So you're at the right spot. Now, when it comes to prerequisites, um, there are none for this, although if you want to sit for the exams, training is mandatory. Exit will not let you sit for the ASM course unless you have training. This course meets those training requirements. So at the end of this course, um, you'll get a certification, a, certi a, a certificate. And uh, what Exin has you do is actually upload that certificate to demonstrate you have the training, and then you'll have access to, uh, excuse me, uh, taking the course. Um, you know, yawning there, by the way, team, I didn't really tell you where I am, did I? Uh, I am in uh, Utah in the United States. I am in the Salt Lake area. I'm about 30 miles south of Salt Lake. And um, I had a late night. Um, my niece was moving, and uh, so family got together to help move. And uh, we weren't done until late. I didn't even get home till about midnight. <laughs> and, uh, and so right now for me, it's uh, 9.13 in the morning. So I had to get up earlier than I wanted. But I'm glad I did. I'm glad that I know you, glad that we're acquainted, and I love the subject matter, and um, I love assisting folks in, you know, learning this material and advancing in their careers. Absolutely love it. So um, I may not be good at a lot of things, but uh, I got a lot of experience here, and um, um you know, nothing better than uh, seeing folks like you go through one of the courses that I have a hand in and having success as a result of that. Now, the value of this course goes beyond just getting your initials and um, – I think we've probably talked about most of this here. We're going to talk about, you know, looking at the top left here, um, good practices in Agile generally and Scrum specifically, um, how to actually implement things that you learn, um, get a lot of knowledge about Scrum, um, and if you already have some, deepen that knowledge. Um, give you some guidance on how to deal with um, transformation projects. And, you know, we'll specifically, I got a, one slide about criticism that you can get when you're doing a transformation and have a whole slide and discussion about resistance and how to overcome it. Then, of course, we're going to learn new things and we're going to drive value, not just from, you know, getting your certificate, uh, but also from uh, the point of view of uh, value for your organization, value for you, value going forward. The uh, course syllabus looks like this. Lesson one is what we call the agile way of thinking. So it's what's agile. We're going to get into some agile principles. We're going to cover what's called the agile manifesto. And we're going to kind of tease you a bit on um, continuous improvement, specifically when it comes to an agile transformation effort. Lesson two is about other agile frameworks. So we're, we'll touch on waterfall again as an approach, 
And then we'll talk about some other methods that belong to the family of Agile. We'll touch on XP and Lean and Crystal and DSDM A-Turn. Not that you're going to be tested on those, but it will help you as a Scrum Master to recognize that um, there's this family from which you can draw some information and experience that uh, will actually enhance your ability to uh, be a good Scrum Master. This is the lesson where we're going to deal with DevOps. And, um, you know, linking um, Scrum projects with operations so that there's things that are done in parallel rather than doing some, you know, development work and then doing a handoff, doing some more development work and then doing a handoff. Have some things going in parallel is a big thing right now as organizations are trying to improve efficiencies and be more responsive to dynamic marketplaces. Um, so we, we've got a couple of slides on that that you'll find interesting. And then similarly, um, linking Agile with IT service management and doing some things in parallel there as well is um, helpful. And understanding that is becoming more and more important as um, the marketplace for projects and folks like us uh, increases. Now, when we get to lesson three, this is where we start diving deeper into Scrum. So we're going to talk about um, a Scrum project lifecycle. We're going to talk about the concept of time boxing and what ceremonies and events in Scrum are time boxed. <clears throat> we're going to actually... <clears throat> Also talk about individually the ceremonies that are part of Scrum. Uh, one of us in the introduction talked about retros, and uh, that was short for retrospectives. And we're going to talk about retrospectives, and when we're finished, you're going to realize that um, – Retrospectives are critical to Scrum and that they are the single most important thing that you will do um, in Scrum to make sure that you are experiencing effective continuous improvement. And we'll also talk about Scrum artifacts, things like, um, you know, product backlog, um, release backlog, sprint backlogs. We'll talk about the definition of done. We'll talk about some information radiators and, you know, things like that. Lesson four is about the roles that belong to Scrum. So we're going to talk uh, first about the Scrum Master, but then we're going to touch on the product owner and um, developer. Um, and then we'll get into some of the best practices of being an effective Scrum Master. Lesson number five has to do with sort of doing Scrum. And so we'll talk about, um, you know, user stories and epics. And we'll talk about product roadmaps and how we do estimating both using um, points and ideal time. Um, we'll talk about uh, planning poker and affinity estimating as common estimation techniques. And we'll get into communicating the status and progress of a project. And this is where we'll again touch on some information radiators like burn down charts, burn up charts, etc. And then how um, that allows us to stay in control, if you will, of the project. Make sure we're headed in the direction we want to go. Lesson six is the uh, one that I talked about that has to do with uh, scaling agile. And then the last one, lesson seven, which is um, about adopting agile, the the uh, you know transition projects. Um, the uh, the test itself has um, you know domains that you're tested on, um, and you might have picked up on this: the scaling of agile and the transformation projects. You know transitions. Um, I like those a lot. I actually, when I took the real exam, I got a hundred percent on these areas on the exam. <laughs> um, I, there were a couple of areas that I didn't do great. I did good enough, um, and. Uh, 
uh, and that might be how it is for you. You know, we all have different strengths and weaknesses. You saw that we have varying uh, levels of experience and, you know, areas of experience. Um, and so there'll be, you know, parts of this whole experience that are you're golden on. And then there'll be others where, you know, it is a little bit more of a learning process. So, and I'm no different, as I just mentioned. So when it comes to the exam itself, um, you know, when we created this slide here, we put 120 hours of study as recommended. And we are trying to set the bar high for that. And now we recognize that um, if you have experience, you're probably not going to need that much. But you know what also uh, we're discovering is that um, if you will stick with the materials that we have, and I got some guidance for you, and you know how to use the materials. Um, you know, after we're finished with this, and this isn't a super long training course, we're going to have four sessions, four hours each, right? Sixteen hours. Now we're going to cram a lot of stuff in there. But, you know, what's interesting is it turns out that we have just really done a great job on what we cover. And uh, this, along with those standard uh, or practice tests, rather, um, there's a pretty darn good chance that you're not going to need to do a whole lot of other study. Um, I will have you do some things between sessions. And, you know, it's not just being here for the four hours, so it's definitely more than that. But but if you're willing to do it and if you're willing to embrace my guidance, I'm going to get you there much faster than if you were to do the more traditional study a ton of stuff, make sure you can lead with knowledge. Um, uh, we're going to kind of focus on the exam part of this as you know, leading with strategy and not with knowledge. The test itself – Oh, case studies, I should mention this. Um, there is um, uh, something that I need you to download, and I, th I think I already put it in the LMS, and it's the assignment. Did I do that? Let me just double check. Yeah, it's this right here, team. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Um, it's the one that says Assignment Scrum Project. Now, there's nothing to turn in on this, but um, at the end of each session, I want you to return to this assignment paper, and we have some questions that build on um, the lessons that we have just done using the same scenarios for the project here. So this is um, – a part of the course, and uh, uh, you'll need to, um, you know, promise that you have actually done this in order to get your certification. Nothing for you to turn in uh, on that, though, but you do have that homework assignment. So the test itself, as I was mentioning earlier, it's 90 minutes, um, and I think I said 180. I got confused. So it's it's an hour and a half, 90 minutes. Um, probably some of you are like, just saying an hour and a half and he's saying 180 minutes. <laughs> okay, so there you go. I'm awesome at math. Um, there are 40 multiple choice questions, like the samples that you saw, A, B, C, or D. And, um, you know, when I first embarked on getting my ASAM and I thought, you know, a 40 question exam, I thought, easy peasy, you know, this isn't going to be a robust certificate uh, certification. Uh, and then I got into the prep work and, uh, and then I got into the practice exams and I thought, oh, I get this. ASM is an awesome credential to have and there might only be 40 questions, but they're not easy. Unless you've been through the workshop and, you know, accepted some of my guidance on how to approach a standardized test, then you'll be golden. Let's see, <laughs> something over here. Do all the lessons and concepts have equal weight in the test, or are some concepts more important? Um, it's all equally weighted. Um, and your results are in the aggregate. It's not for each of the domains. So while everything's weighted equally, you can do really good in an area like I did, which will help make up for some areas where you're not quite as strong. Good question. And I like that question, King, because 
you're thinking about the exam, right? And getting it done. So uh, your head's in the right spot. Now, here's also what's interesting is you only need 65% to pass, meaning you got to get 26 out of the 40 questions. Um, and that seems low. I, I get that it seems low. Um, but, you know, after you've gone through this workshop and you've taken the exam, you'll be like me. You'll think, wow. They really did a great job of crafting this exam and making that credential something of relevance in the marketplace. So that's about the course. Um, um, if you're new to eggs in, um, what you may want to do is just at some point in time, just go to eggsin.com and poke around, see what kind of certifications they have there, and then eventually drill down to the um, ASM one. Sorry about that. <clears throat> You're paying the price for me uh, trying to be a blessing for my niece and her family. <laughs> it's all good, right? Win-win. Okay, and I noticed the uh, uh, the confirmation there, Viraj, that we uh, got your question answered. Um, okay, so that takes us to the end of lesson one. So what we're going to do now is we're going to shift gears and we're going to go to lesson number three. So this lesson is about Scrum events <clears throat> and artifacts. Scrum events are also called ceremonies, by the way, and at the end of this lesson, you should be able to list the values of Scrum, explain the life cycle of a Scrum project from backlog to working system, conduct the Scrum event, sprint planning, sprint review, sprint retrospective, and daily Scrum, participate in the creation and interpretation of Scrum artifacts like product backlog, sprint backlog, finished deliverables, and the definition of done. Uh, let's see, somebody, oh, there was a question here that was chatted. <clears throat> um, ba, ba, ba. Oh, can you please come again with the strategy of going through the last uh, first while selecting an answer? <clears throat> I can do that, and that's actually one of the documents that you can download on Simply Talk. And this is it right here. So question strategies, five of them. Read the last sentence first, then the whole question if necessary. Read all four answers, throw out the, e the ones that you can throw out, and then select the best from those that are remaining. That's the strategic approach on the questions. Uh, let me minimize that. And now let's talk about the um, <clears throat> values of Scrum. Now, this is different than pillars. This is um, values. So there are five um, <clears throat> values for that. And this is something that I want you to memorize. So I'm going to switch my cameras here and go to the whiteboard. And we're going to add to our list. Oh, wrong color. You can tell I'm a project manager because that would bother me. So the five values of Scrum, and there's an acronym. You can see that on the screen, right? C Force. <clears throat> Okay, so five values of Scrum. And C, F, O, R, C. And you kind of know my style here. You don't have to do it this way. You know, whatever works for you. But have some kind of a strategy for memorizing things. It will probably serve you well. So the um, the first C is commitment. The next one, there are four, <laughs> four. F is focus. O is openness. Is that two ends or one? 
I don't know, openness. We'll blame it on the marker if it's not right. Um, R is for respect. And the last C is courage. And so there's your little chart right there. And um, let me just briefly go over these. Um, none of these will be a big surprise here. Um, we've talked about some of them already in one context or another. <clears throat> um, so the, for commitment, that means the, commit, the team is going to commit to deliver value to the customer. Um, they're on board, there's the buy-in, all of that's there. Focus, the team is going to focus on the few important things um, at a time. So we're going to do time boxing, uh, we're not going to do things broadly, specifically uh, focus on a few things at a time. O is openness, that's analogous to the T, transparency and the pillars, meaning we're going to be completely open in sharing um, information about the project, our own opinions, our fears, our concerns, etc. R stands for respect, and that's kind of a 360 view. We respect ourselves, we respect others, we respect the uh, concepts that we are using as part of Scrum, and um, <clears throat> Um, and you know, and we respect the other stakeholders as well, 360. And the last C stands for courage, and that's the courage to make commitments uh, even when we're in an uncertain environment. Um, courage to deal with um, fear that comes from a failure, uh, courage to uh, share disagreements openly yet respectfully, um, courage to participate in debating technical approaches, etc. Okay, so now let's go to the Scrum Lifecycle chart and what I want to do is I want to elaborate on this just a little bit. And I'm going to try and use my mouse to do some <laughs> some uh, additions to this. Um, first of all, we have the product backlog. The product backlog has to be kept current, and we call that grooming. Grooming is adding user stories and removing user stories from the product backlog. Product backlog is the scope of the project. The product owner owns that. The team assists in that effort. Related to grooming is pruning. Pruning the backlog is prioritizing and reprioritizing. So the product backlog is pruned and groomed regularly throughout the course of the project. Now. There is a meeting that takes place right here, which is called the Sprint Planning Meeting. Can I just do P, S, P here? Sprint Planning Meeting. Okay, that is one of the ceremonies or events that um, takes place in Scrum. In the, um, the Sprint Planning Meeting, it is a time-boxed event, and it is time-boxed to two hours for each week of the sprint. So in our example here, we have a 30-day sprint. So if we have a four-week sprint, then our sprint planning meeting will be eight hours in duration. And two things happen during the sprint planning meeting. The user stories that are going to be included in the sprint are selected. Right? They're put into the sprint backlog, which is a subset of the product backlog containing the user stories that are going to be completed during the sprint. And the second thing that happens during the sprint planning meeting is the selected user stories are then disaggregated into tasks and estimated. Once that's done, then the work at the sprint begins. There will be a daily scrum like we did at the beginning of our workday together as our team. And then at the end of the work of the uh, sprint, there will be the sprint review. The sprint review meeting or ceremony 
is also time boxed, and it is time boxed to one hour for each week of the sprint. So if we're doing a four-week sprint, the sprint review meeting would be four hours in length. The primary purpose of the review is to showcase and demo the software and get feedback from relevant stakeholders and allow the product owner to say, I accept or I reject the work that has been done. Then, after that is the sprint retrospective. Now, this is where the team asks and answers three questions. What went well, what did not go well, and what are we going to do different going forward regarding the previous sprint that was just completed and the ones that is, is just coming up? Um, and then the uh, the sprint itself will result in working software or value for the customer. And then, of course, everything goes back and repeats for as many sprints uh, as necessary to complete the scope of the project. Um, let's see. I see a chat here. How similar or different is the product backlog to SRS, software requirement specs document, which is widely used in projects? Um, it's different. Um, and if you will hang on to that question, um, we're going to have a discussion later on about user stories, and that will help you understand uh, the differences. Um, and we'll get into the user stories that come from the customer and user stories that come from the tech domain, and that will help answer your question. So you okay hanging on to that? Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so a um, little bit more detailed view of the Scrum project lifecycle. Now let's talk about a couple other things here. When it comes to um, a sprint, there are some things that affect the duration of the sprint. So the team is going to have to decide how long each of the sprints are going to be, and things that are a factor include the stability of the product backlog. If the product backlog is changing a great deal, um, then that's going to argue for shorter durations um, because there's uh, a high level of uncertainty, and so you have a greater amount of control on your project if you have shorter sprints. Now, on the other hand, another factor is the cost of iterating. Every time we do a sprint, there are costs associated with the sprint planning meeting, the sprint review. The sprint retrospective, right? People show up to those meetings, you got to pay them. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so there, there is an overhead cost to actually doing sprints. The goal of the sprint is working software. At the end, the end product should be near releasable or potentially shippable. Now, there might be working software that the product owner isn't going to want to release, um, maybe because it, as a standalone component of working software for the system, doesn't create any value or any usability for end users. Uh, and maybe you wait till the end of a release before you release everything. But the idea is that it's working software and it could be released if um, the customer wanted to do that. <coughs> um, sorry, I just dropped something. I see a question there. I will circle back to your question in just a sec. Um, the sprint duration and deliverables do not change once the team has committed. This is another one of those things that has to be viewed as absolute when we're doing Scrum. So if we say that we're going to do a two-week sprint and we select five user stories based on our velocity or capacity, once that decision has been made, the duration of the sprint does not change and we do not add or remove any user stories. Now, it could be possible for the product owner to cancel a sprint, but that would be extreme. That would be because there is 
such a major change to the product backlog that the work of the current sprint is going to be completely irrelevant. You don't change the sprint, you cancel the sprint. And then the bottom one here, the sprint begins with planning and ends with review and a retrospective. And there was a question here, are there any issues with combining the retrospective and the planning ceremonies? And the answer to that is yes. Now, could they be combined depending on the environment? The answer is yes. And the way we would arrive at whether or not it would make sense is who's going to be participating. Um, but they would be separate agendas. So the agenda for the retrospective is what went well, what did not go well, what are we going to do different? And the mandatory participants for that meeting are the the, the team, the scrum team. Is the scrum master going to be there likely as a facilitator? Um, is the product owner going to be there? Maybe, maybe not. If the product owner is there, you know, the product owner could maybe answer questions and help clarify. But the the product owner does not weigh in on what went well, what did not go well, and what are we going to do differently. That is all owned by the team. In the planning meeting, the product owner has to be there, and the product owner is the main driver of that meeting. Um, the product owner is talking about or dealing with the priority of the user stories. The team's weighing in. Maybe there's some dependencies that need to be considered, but um, the product owner has to make the hard decisions with regard to what's going to be done in the next sprint based on the constraints from the team, like velocity um, and technology and sequencing and things like that. So um, I kind of answered that from a real-world point of view. Yes, it could be. It's not desirable. On the test, they are completely separate. Did I get you there? I'll keep my eye on the chat box. Make sure I got that answered well enough for you. And let's move ahead. Okay, the sprint planning meeting. This is uh, looking right down here. This is conducted at the beginning of a new sprint. It's attended by the team, the product owner, and the scrum master. And there are two approaches to deciding what's going to be included in the sprint. It can be based on commitment, and it can also be based on velocity. And the goal here is to get team buy-in, make sure that there is um, clarity between the team and the product owner as to what the definition of done looks like for the user stories that are going to be included in the sprint. And, um, of course, it should be realistic and achievable. And, you know, there can be a little bit of, of um, an issue where you've got, you know, a well-meaning product owner that's driving really hard and the team says, you know, we can do these sprints and the product owner is saying, no, come on, you've got to do at least one more. I've got to have this one in this sprint. Um, you could get a question like that and it might be, what would the scrum master do if you had a dominant product owner that's trying to persuade the team to do more than the team thinks it can do. Um, and that's where the Scrum Master comes in. The Scrum Master plays the role of the mentor, the coach, and, uh, you know, assisting in the resolution of those kinds of issues without deciding. The Scrum Master is not a decider. The team decides uh, when it comes to how, and the product owner decides when it comes to what. Okay, <clears throat> the scrum meeting, uh, daily scrum, we've talked about it, right? The entire team attends the meeting. Could the product owner be there? Yes. Does the product owner need to be there? No. Sometimes the product owner can be, uh, you know, an impediment to the meeting, um, but would be welcome. But if the product owner started asking questions or became the focus of questions being asked, uh, the scrum master would have to help facilitate a change because um, that would not be effective for the daily scrum. Duration, 15 minutes. We talked about that. And the agenda. What did I do yesterday? What am I going to do today? And what are my impediments? <clears throat> the sprint review. Now, who attends? It's going to be the team, the product owner, the scrum master, and potentially others. So, optionally, others you know that we would want to get feedback from would be end users, um, operations folks, the suits. 
Um, all of those would be welcome depending on the relevance of the software that's being demoed and being um, uh, subject to the acceptance testing and the product owner, you know, giving the thumbs up or the thumbs down when it comes to acceptance. The duration for this, we mentioned this before, it's not just a flat two hours, it's one hour per week. So if you did a four week sprint, you would plan on the review being a maximum of four hours in duration. The agenda is to demo the completed software, get feedback, and then see where we are when it comes to the, the release plan. The retrospective, who is there? It's attended by the team. And I would modify this slightly, and I would say this is the the mandatory group that needs to be there. Um, optionally, the scrum master would be there. Potentially, you could have a, an external facilitator. The role of the scrum master would be the facilitator. Now, um, a good scrum master being a facilitator in a retrospective would have some knowledge of control charts, the five whys, um, um, Ishikawa diagrams, things like that. And although the Scrum Master would not be participating in the actual use of the tools, the Scrum Master would be facilitating the effective use of those tools. Um, when it comes to duration, the rule is 45 minutes for each week. Ooh, that was a good four. That was kind of a lousy five. <laughs> so if you had a uh, two-week um, uh, sprint, then you would have an hour and a half retrospective max. And what's the purpose? There's uh, the agenda for the retrospective, three questions. What worked well? What did not go well? What are we going to do different? And it's not just a chat session. Well, that would be part of it. You will use tools and techniques, um, like some that I mentioned, control charts, um, Ishikawa diagrams, um, five whys. There's a number of things that you might use uh, in order to surface uh, assignable causes for issues so that we could then come up with a resolution to those. Um, this is where continuous improvement um, is uh, going to happen. Um, you know, continuous improvement is the result of other things, but this is the main thing. And if you were to get a question about the relevance or the necessity of retrospectives, there is no equivocation. You do a retrospective after every sprint. Um, if you don't do a retros, um, if you don't, then um, there's no improvement. Um, you know, things just stay static. Okay, so we talked about the four main ceremonies, right, in uh, a Scrum project. Sprint planning, you with me? Daily stand-up, the sprint review, and then the sprint retrospective. All considered mandatory for effectively doing Scrum. And not doing them uh, or one of them would be considered a fail. Okay, artifacts that we use when it comes to Scrum. Uh, we've talked about the product backlog. We talked about the sprint backlog. There's also um, a release backlog. Uh, depending on the size of the project, it might be advisable to uh, group user stories into releases. Um, if you have a product roadmap, uh, your releases would line up for that. Um, for example, I've got a... Um, uh, a real life project that I'm working on, and my product roadmap is um, uh, got three versions. It's a website. Um, the first uh, version is free. Uh, the second version includes a membership component, and the third uh, version includes um, a referral commission uh, portion to it. And so I will then uh, do three releases. I'll have all the user stories that will result in version one, all the, the user stories that re result in version two. So that's what the release uh, backlog is. 
And so if you look at it in sequence, the product backlog is the overall scope of the project. The release backlog is a subset of the product backlog. And then the sprint backlog would be a subset of the release backlog. The product backlog might look something like this. Um, it's a list of user stories that are written by the product owner and are going to be developed by the um, team members. And didn't we have – we had a product backlog for – the thing that we did this morning, right? So here's another example of a product backlog. Um, uh, this is more of a list. Um, and it just has the title. There would be a user story card for each of the items in the product backlog. Um, but the idea would be it would be prioritized. Uh, there could be user stories that are added or removed depending on what the product owner wants. Product owner owns the product backlog. Um, that's a given. Uh, does the product owner create all the user stories for the product backlog in isolation? No, absolutely not, because there are technical considerations that the product back or the product owner might not um, even consider. The product uh, owner's perspective is more the customer side, the end user side, um, and so the product owner might not even think of things like security or architecture-related things, um, and there might even be uh, user stories that come from the technical domain that need to be uh, developed before some of the uh, product's owner's user stories. Another artifact is the definition of done. The definition of done is primarily a checklist. And this is what forms the agreement between the product owner and the team um, as to when we consider something completely done. And if we look down here, it's um, – uh, where's my – I'm looking for my cursor. It says here, it's usually prepared by the Scrum Master in consultation with the team. Um, that is, I would modify this slightly. Um, the definition of done is really driven by the team. The, see, the Scrum Master is never a decision maker. If you have a Scrum Master that's saying, we have to have this in the definition of done, then that's an infringement on the empowerment of the team. I agree that the, the Scrum Master is a part of the effort to develop the definition of done, um, but I would kind of flip that. Uh, the Scrum Master is the facilitator. It's the team that still um, owns that. So um, now, is the product owner involved in this? Absolutely, because the product owner is involved in defining the story and what a fully implemented story looks like. So here's a list, <coughs> a short list of what a definition of done could look like. The story has been fully implemented or the code completed as described. Um, automated unit tests have been developed with at least 80% code coverage. Um, it could be more than that. Um, this is just an example. Automated unit tests and acceptance tests of the story are passing. No severity has one or two defects. And then high priority test cases have been automated and added to the regression suite. Um, the definition of done, we point out, is likely to evolve as the team's maturity increases as the project advances. So um, what did we talk about? We talked about um, the five values of Scrum. We talked about the four ceremonies or time box events that belong in a Scrum project. We talked about the sprint um, planning meeting. We talked about the daily Scrum. We talked about the sprint review, and we talked about the sprint retrospective. Um, and then we talked about artifacts. The primary artifacts we talked about, the four of them, the product backlog, the release backlog, the sprint backlog, and the definition of done. Um, so pretty good, right team?
So what we're going to do now is we're going to take our quiz on lesson number three. Um, oh, question here. Is there going to be a definition of done at the release level? Yes, there should be a definition of done at the release level. Absolutely. Uh, and depending on the nature of the project, uh, the team and the product owner may decide to do a definition of done for a sprint as well. Um, but um, clearly for each user story, right? And clearly for each release, potentially for a sprint. Okay, so will you double check and change your chat box uh, send to option to me privately and let's go ahead and do our quiz. Question number one, how should the team respond to this? Last sentence first, right? And then after the start of a sprint, the product owner wants to add one more story to the sprint backlog. How should the team respond to this? Okay, I'm seeing some good comments here. Okay, let's see how many. Looks like most of us have responded. So. <clears throat> This is testing us on um, our understanding of time boxing in general and uh, how we do sprints. So first of all, I remind you that once a sprint has been decided on, right, once the planning meeting is over, you never add or remove anything from the sprint backlog. And number two, when it comes to time boxing, you never extend the duration of the time box. So with that reminder, now granted, that's some knowledge, right? But that's critical knowledge for being a good scrum master and passing the exam. So if we look at answer A, include it in the backlog and extend the sprint, right? That's a violation of both of those two things. B, include it in the, in the backlog only if the PO, the product owner, removes another item of equal size. And it can't do that, right, because that's adding and removing both. C, ask the product owner to wait until the next sprint. Ah, that's a possibility. Hang on to that one. D, add as a stretch goal but make no commitment. Nope, you cannot add. So there you go. The answer is C. Now, there was, um, there was a question about an example on canceling a sprint. I will do that after we're finished with the quiz, and I think it's already not displaying anymore. So if I forget, just remind me again, whoever it was that answered that question, and I'll give you an example that might help you um, uh, understand that better. Okay, so for this uh, question, the answer has got to be C, in my opinion. Make sense? There it is. Okay, question number two. Which of the following is a scenario where the product owner should consider canceling the sprint? Well, maybe we'll take care of that question right now. Okay, so looking at our choices here, <laughs> we are kind of all over the place on this one. So that means I didn't do a great job in explaining the cancellation part. So you have my apologies, and we're going to remedy that right now. Um, now, remember, we never add or remove items from a sprint, nor do we ever extend the duration of a sprint. We're good on that, right? So that doesn't change when we consider this question right here. So um, let me give you an example. Let's say that um, the product owner created a product backlog to um, do a um, accounts receivable and accounts payable system. And um, we're into the project and the product owner says, you know what? Um, 
what I really need us to do is to come up with a CRM system, a customer relationship management system. So the accounts receivable part is relevant. We need to know who our customers are, and we're going to need to track the revenue and things like that. That's all needs to be part of our CRM. Um, but I don't need accounts payable anymore. And so that would be what we would call a mid-course correction, a mid-course change. Now, if the team were in a sprint working on user stories that had to do with the accounts payable system, once the product owner made the decision to make, go in a different direction, the work of that sprint that has to do with the AP system is now irrelevant. And so that would then be a case where the whole sprint itself would be canceled because the work being done in the sprint is no longer going to be part of the project. So um, major change. Now that probably helps get us to the correct answer, right? Um, a, the product owner wants to add a high priority item to the sprint backlog. No, um, we don't cancel it for that reason. What we would say to the product owner is, um, you know, we're in the middle of a sprint right now. I mean, sprints are short, right? You tell the product owner, hang on to it. We'll, you know, we'll be pruning and grooming the product backlog. That can be the top priority for the next sprint. B, the product owner felt that one of the sprint backlog items was no longer needed. Okay, now the team may then not do that user story, but um, you're not adding or removing. You're not replacing it with something else. And then she, the team reported that they were way behind schedule in the sprint. <laughs> not that that would ever happen, right? Um, but that's not a reason to cancel the sprint. Um, boy, that's a reason to have a good retrospective and say, why is it that we're so far behind? You know, there could be a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons might be, you know, the team really screwed up when it came to sizing the user stories. And uh, you would not want to cancel the sprint because it would rob the team of a lot of information about why that sprint was failing or a portion of it, it was failing. So then we get to D, the sprint backlog was rendered useless due to a major change. So that's the answer, right? And that, after we kind of reinforce the, the knowledge on that, that makes sense. Now, um, Oh, there was a question here that I think is relevant for this. Um, oh, there was a question posed. What if the product owner is adamant that a user story be added to a sprint and is not willing to wait? Ha, ah, okay. That's where a good scrum master becomes invaluable to an organization. And uh, the scrum master would, of necessity, have to talk with the product owner and do some coaching and mentoring and say, you know, this isn't the way it works. And, you know, you're talking about one user story, but remember, you've got a whole product backlog of user stories. And if we start abandoning the practices that work, you know, the practices that will deliver the value you want, um, you know, it'll be it'll be messed up, and so we got to stick with it. Now, if the product owner has a really high priority item um, in a sprint planning meeting, um, there may be some discussion and some give and take, and you know, some you know, a way to figure out a way to maybe you know meet a deadline that the product owner has, maybe by you know doing part of it or something. Um, but uh, uh, other than that, um, the product owner does not get to dictate to the team um, how it's going to do its work. And doing so derails uh, the scrum process and robs the project of the effectiveness of using scrum to run the project. Okay, so back to this question here, D is the right answer. There it is. Okay, so question number three. What should be done about the remaining two stories? A team completed eight out of ten stories planned in a sprint. What should be done about the remaining two stories? Uh, 
okay, so let's just chat about this. And my compliments to you as a team, everybody was throwing out B and D as near as I could tell. And I saw chats like um, the sprint is time box, so it couldn't be, so you can't extend it. Let's see, there's some chats about D. I would throw out B and D. Um, definitely not B and D. Let's see, no intermediate sprint should be done. Yeah, comments like that. So, and there's a lot. There's probably some that have already scrolled off to the top here. So B and D are out, right? So then it's down to A or C. And I saw a couple chats that said it's kind of a tie between A and C. So for some of us, it became a 50-50. Now, I had one chat that said um, probably C because if there were only 10 user stories in the product backlog and there's just two left over, there's no point to reprioritize. Um, I can't remember who chatted that, but notice that the question is about a sprint, and it's not referring to the product backlog. It's eight out of ten user stories for the sprint. There could be a hundred user stories in the product backlog yet. Um, so that's probably just a case of reading a little bit too fast, and that's one of the dangers, right? Um, we mentioned that earlier today, I think. You know, there's the pressure to go fast, but then there's the risk going too fast. So um, the idea here would be that uh, – oh, and somebody chatted this. The product owner chooses what goes into the sprints, not the team. So therefore, the item should be moved back to the product backlog and then be candidates for the next sprint based on what the product owner wants to do. And that's probably the best chat uh, that I saw as far as the logic to going with A over C. Um, so I believe then that A is a superior answer to C. Um, it might end up being that C happens, but it wouldn't be what is automatically done. Uh, here's another chat. So before moving to the next sprint, the product backlog should be pruned, and therefore it should be A. Yes, that is exactly right. Um, the product backlog is continually pruned and groomed, and it's definitely pruned and groomed when we're doing the review and we're doing the planning. It can be pruned and groomed at other times as well, but definitely that's part of the agenda for those two meetings. Okay, so therefore, I believe the best answer is A, and there it is. Okay, question number four. Who should determine the duration of a sprint in Scrum. <laughs> Some brilliant chats here. This is great. Yeah. Uh, Bianca, excellent. Okay, so let's chat about this just briefly. And let me see if I can use your chats to um, actually do this instead of me here. Um, here's a chat. Um, a scrum master is never the decision maker. Oh, that's a true statement. That would suggest we got to throw out B, right? Um, let's see what other chats do we have here. Team has to decide upon the the uh, on how the uh, the uh, work is done. Uh, another chat. Product owner deals with the what's the team deals with the house. So therefore, the product owner gets eliminated, um, and as well the scrum master. Let's see. The team is an empowered team. It has to make the decisions. Yes, team. Um, Um, there was a chat here that says maybe the Scrum Master after collecting inputs from the team. Now, that looks more like a project manager. That's not how we do it in Scrum. Um, the Scrum Master may facilitate discussions, um, but the team owns the decision. The uh, product owner doesn't dictate to the team how the work will be done. Neither does the Scrum Master. Um, 
Yep, then they would work as a team for the sprint once the team's been formed. Um, yep. Go with A. Cool, cool, cool. Let's see, did I miss anything here? I think that's right. Um, the customer, you know, interestingly enough, the customer is not part of Scrum. The product owner is the customer voice. Now, the customer could be the product owner, but um, the only time the customer is a role, uh, a defined role in agile methods is for XP. It's the actual customer. In Scrum, we call it the product owner. Could be the customer, uh, but the product owner is, um, uh, at a minimum, the customer voice, if not the actual customer. So um, D goes out. It's uh, actually not even a possibility because it's not um, a possible who. The customer doesn't exist uh, in Scrum. And so the answer has got to be A. And there it is. Okay, so team, um, that takes us to the end of our slides for lesson number three.